Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Barr, and I want to read a quick introduction. Michael Barr is a senior lecturer in international relations at Flinders University. His PhD thesis, Lee Kuan Yew, The Belief Behind the Man, won him the 1999 Asian Studies Association of Australia's President's Prize. It's a long mouthful. For the best PhD thesis, numerous works since then have enhanced his reputation as a keen observer of Singapore politics and history. He will be talking about um, splits in the elite then and now. Dr. Michael, please. Thank you, Nivi. I don't know whether I'm going to make 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> the splits in the elite that I'm speaking about then and now, the now is the possibility of, uh, of splits that might come up and the signs that there are some now. And for those of you who want the juicy inside story, I'm sorry, but my uh, my reading is that there's no serious prospect of, uh, of splits at the moment. <laughs> the then is more interesting. That split, the split that did take place and was kept subterranean in the 1990s, the split between Go and the two leaves, Father, Son and Holy Go. The, this is all done in the context of the dramatic 2011 election results, both the general elections in May and the presidential elections in August. They have led to a lot of speculation and in some minds a lot of optimism about the possibility of a future opposition victory and even democratisation. I was in Singapore doing research uh, just a few months before the May elections and I was doing work on uh, opposition politics, which was actually inspired by a conversation I had with, uh, with Robert Cribb some months earlier. The, and I got to speak to a lot of opposition uh, leaders, party leaders and activists. I have found that these days I have much better access to opposition uh, sources than I have to government sources. Times have changed. There is a major line, there was at that time a major line in their thinking, that they were, there was serious optimism, almost planning, that there would be an opposition victory within 10 years in Singapore. Being launched by a beachhead, in, uh, opposition beachhead in Parliament, uh, which you may say that they achieved in the last elections, but they achieved in absolutely the most minimalist fashion. Six parliamentary seats, one group representation constituency. That's not to be scoffed at. GRCs were set up never to fall to the opposition, and this one did fall. So let's not minimise the significance of that, but let's not also read too much into it. But the scenario was that there would be a split in the Cabinet, and there would be an opposition in uh, sufficient strength in Parliament to make a difference, and there would be a realignment of politics, which would include the opposition after a split in the elite. That's what raises the question of the likelihood and the uh, possible alignments of a split in the elite, which by this, in this context, I mean split in cabinet. But particularly in cabinet, that's where it has to happen, that's where it has to start, but it would be a split that would go through the judiciary, through the military, through the civil service, through the, group, uh, through, through the, the government linked companies. It would follow, in my mind, a model that was uh, set up by Taiwan, and where there was a democratisation process and moved to the opposition following a split in the elite, a split generated by one person, President Tim Lee, uh, uh, Lee Ting Wei, who basically split his own party quite deliberately, sponsored the opposition, and there was yet another split in his own party for the, 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 the GMD guys who did not like that, and we found a Democratic Progressive Party majority and president. I think this is a most unlikely development to take place in Singapore for three very specific reasons. The first and the main reason for this is that the Singapore elite is much more risk averse than the Taiwanese elite ever was. 
Singapore is much smaller than Taiwan. Its economy is much more fragile. Its economy is much more exposed to uh, every bug and whim and breeze that passes through the global economy, not to mention all the bugs that are in the water. And uh, it would, a split in the elite, you don't get into the elite in Singapore, you don't get into the cabinet in Singapore unless you accept this, and the entire, the entire political economy of the country is set up with this vulnerability at its centre. And of course that has its own political purposes in terms of we need to show solidarity, we need to work together to work uh, for, the, the, for the good of the nation and that has a lot of other implications. But the implication here is that it is almost inconceivable there would be a split from the elite that would be entered into voluntarily. Dissidents in cabinet would be putting at risk the very fundamentals of the Singapore economic and financial and industrial system. I do not see them doing that. The second reason, I doubt the likelihood of this scenario, is a bit counterintuitive. Prime Minister Li Xianlong has successfully used the PAP's electoral setbacks in 2011 to consolidate his position in the elite. He's effectively shifted the blame for the parliamentary losses onto other people, most notably his father, who you've got to say made it easy for him. <laughs> and by ensuring that he's been given credit for the result not being any worse than it was. Uh, the, the exchange for this is he has sacrificed the elite standing of the elite, the, so the pristine standing of the elite, by apologising and saying, I'm sorry, but we made so many mistakes, we're not going to do that again. That is unprecedented. Those words can't be taken back. That has damaged the brand name of the elite. It's a big cost, but nevertheless he's done it. And then, even though he did badly in the elections, the PAP did badly in the elections, uh, both sets of elections actually, the Li Xianlong successfully managed the post-election environment, beginning with election night. My wife and I stayed up uh, watching the election results online. Adelaide time, hour and a half behind Singapore, four o'clock in the morning, we were still watching the results. I know how to show a girl a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was able to see that the elections department was stage managing and timing the individual election results constituency by constituency so that Li Xian Lung could romp up onto the stage just after the PAP got its majority. And he was up there as one of own, the leader of own, let's just say that he was basically the only, uh, his was the only team, his, his was the only team that got an increase in its vote. Partly because he did so badly last time, he got an increase in his vote. And then he was able to take the credit for the majority, for the, for the win, for the, the uplifting of his own personal vote. And then the loss of Val Juniard was announced afterwards as a footnote. And yet that result had been settled, that there was no recount, had been settled hours earlier. And there was no recount. That result was held back. So he successfully managed the uh, the post-election environment, and he managed to then get rid of, reconstruct the cabinet the way he wanted to. He got rid of the dead wood, including his father, but not just his father. An entire one-third of cabinet left as a result of that election, either natural standing down, people not being, uh, and people being defeated, and then people being pushed out. The other thing is that there had been dissident rumblings in Cabinet in the lead-up to that election. I interviewed uh, nominated MP Viswa Sadasavan, as part when I was there in January, and he told me that he'd be gotten used to government MPs and even a couple of Cabinet Ministers coming up to him and congratulating him for the, the, the speeches that he was making in Parliament, but not one of them would allow themselves to be associated with him, not one of them would support him. 
This is not what splits are made of. He was contemptuous of them. He was just as contemptuous of the opposition because they were even running further away from supporting him or associating themselves with his speeches. Which is another reason why you don't want to get too optimistic. The third reason, I doubt the likelihood of a split, is that there was one in the mid-1990s when Go Chok Tong was Prime Minister and he was using the, his control of the appointments to the government linked companies and to the civil service to, to overwhelm the uh, institutional base of Li Shen Lung, oh, sorry, sorry, yes, of Li, Shen, of, Li, of, of Li Kuan Yu at that stage, and of Li Shen Lung as the heir apparent. And he was willing, he was pushing this, it was working. He caught the Lees accepting multi-million dollar discounts on the soft launch of a property development and he did not report that to the corruption the corrupt practices investigation bureau instead they had a bit of a chat around the table and said well we all understand and the discounts were repaid that was his one chance he had been using a body called the Directorship and Consultancy Appointment, Appointments Council, which is a secret organisation, and at that stage controlled those appointments to the GLCs. Uh, after this event, Go basically gave up. The power of the, DC, the, the DCAC to make those appointments was taken from them and given through various mechanisms, mainly to members of and close associates of the Lee family, through Tomasic Holdings, and the SGIC and the uh, Singapore Technologies. That was it. After that, Li Shen Lung was effectively Prime Minister of Domestic Affairs. Go Chok Tong was off to the Middle East building Singapore's relationships where he couldn't do any harm, might even do some good. This was how it was explained to, be, to me by a member of the elite in 2003. I didn't understand it at the time. I understand it better now. If a split didn't happen then, it ain't gonna happen now. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Uh, from, from looking at the elites, now we're gonna move on to an analysis of the 2011 elections. Um, quick introduction. Um, Lili Zubaydah Rahim is an associate professor in government and international relations at University of Sydney. Her book, The Singapore Dilemma, The Political and Educational Marginality of the Malay Community, established her as a leading researcher on political and social developments in Singapore. Dr. Lily, please. I'd first like to thank um, the organizers of this uh, update, uh, in particular Greg Lopez, um, who I've been in contact with uh, quite a bit in the last uh, few weeks. And I, and I dearly hope that this event is uh, held on a regular uh, basis. Um, because as we all know, Singapore and Malaysia uh, studies, Singapore and Malaysian studies, tends to be uh, sometimes, uh, well, somewhat overshadowed uh, by, you know, Indonesian studies, Thai studies, and, and so on, despite the significance of these two uh, countries, to, uh, at least to, to Australia, uh, in economic terms, social, political, security, strategic terms. I've entitled my uh, presentation, Scaling Back the Singaporean Developmental State, the 2011 Electoral uh, Backlash. Focusing on, on the elections, um, I argue, uh, represents a political watershed of, of sorts. And as noted by Michael, <coughs> it's significant for various reasons, one of which is that the PAP lost one group representative constituency. Uh, multi-member seat and it was uh, designed by the PAP in the mid-1990s uh, uh, for the opposite, is essentially to uh, impede the, the electoral advance, advancement of the opposition. So it was quite unexpected that the uh, Aljuna GRC would, um, would, would be lost to the PA, PAP. Although if we look at the previous election, uh, Aljunit uh, was a seat that uh, GRC that the PAP also nearly uh, lost. 
However, what's significant of, uh, with regard to this election is that never before had so many PAP ministers lost uh, their seats and also uh, resign following uh, the elections, which uh, Michael also uh, mentioned. So what then are the key forces fueling this dramatic electoral and political uh, shift? The first point, um, this is the election results. Uh, the Father, the Son, and the, uh, the Holy Ghost, as voted by uh, Michael. The, the Singapore cabinet, uh, post election, you might notice there's not one woman, so there is a, a significant gen gender imbalance <coughs> here. But um, if we're looking at some of the reasons for why the PAP performed uh, poorly in relative terms in the Australian context, of course. Um, you know, winning, uh, losing 40% of the vote is actually not such a bad thing. Uh, but in the Singapore context, it, you know, it's often perceived as, it's perceived as disastrous. It's the worst electoral performance of the PAP since um, independence. So this weakening legitimacy can be, uh, well, I've strongly attributed to the technocratic and dyna dynastic governance of uh, the, the People's Action Party, a party that is increasingly out of touch uh, with the public mood, the public mood for greater public consultation, transparent governance, political uh, pluralism, and social economic equity, growth with equity. Um, since the retirement of many of the PAP All Guards uh, in the 1980s, the party, I argue in my paper, has become largely hollow and a ceremonial type entity based on a Leninist Kader system where MPs and rank and file members have minimal clout in terms of policy uh, formulation. The party also appears to, to have difficulty uh, in attracting those who have a reputation as public intellectuals and others with a solid record of public service, actively engaged in civil, uh, uh, civil, uh, in civil society. Um, and the leaked WikiLeaks diplomatic cables uh, have revealed that, uh, particularly since 2006, the PAP has been fielding second and third tier candidates this is an admission on the part of a PAP MP, uh, Alan Chong, and I'm, I'm sure he's pretty annoyed that uh, you know this diplomatic cable uh, has been uh, revealed. So, in other words, the PAP has not been successful in attracting high-quality candidates to the party, uh, particularly since uh, 2006. So the question then is, is Lee Sian Lung, the Prime Minister, up to the major political challenge of reforming this technocratic party with strong dynastic tendencies? And I'm not so upbeat uh, with regard to his ability to reinvent the, the party. Now Lee Kuan Yew may no longer be in cabinet, but he continues to be a member of parliament. He continues to wield significant influence. Uh, he continues to issue regular speeches about public policy. Um, and the Lee family also continues to retain pivotal positions in government agencies, in <coughs> government link companies, and so on. And, and this is one of the reasons why I'm not so upbeat about the ability of Lee Sian Lung to reinvent uh, the, the party and to, or to be more responsive to the, to the mood, on the, the public mood on the uh, ground. Now, the other dimension is the acute sense of relative deprivation felt by many Singaporeans to do with the widening income gap. Now, Singapore boasts one of the largest national reserves, uh, 248 billion US dollars, uh, it's also one of the wealthiest countries in the world in GDP per capita terms, much wealthier than Australia. Uh, at the moment, it's 59,900 US uh, dollars. However, this uh, so-called economic success has come at quite a high price, come at a high cost, 
one of which is the widening income gap, the Gini coefficient ratio, which is the second worst in Southeast Asia after Thailand. Um, and far worse than other comparable North, uh, developmental states in Northeast Asia, such as Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And the Singapore political economy is often compared with these Northeast Asian uh, states. Three minutes left, and I've just uh, started. Oh dear. Um, and recently, the Minister of Finance, you know, made a statement, um, and, but this is well known, that the earnings of the poorest 20% of Singaporeans have stagnated. The earnings of the poorest 20% of Singaporeans have stagnated, while the richest 20% of households have uh, soared. And many Singaporeans attribute this to the, the influx of this huge res uh, reserve uh, army of cheap foreign labor. Uh, as you know, a main reason for depressing wages. But not only that, stifling productivity. So if we look at the various national polls, and I think Bridget will be talking about this, taken before the 2011 elections, more Singaporeans express concerns about bread and butter issues, material issues. Um, now, selective scaling back of the developmental state. I argue in my paper, paper here that it has breached the social compact that was forged between the PAP and the Singaporean public. And this is one of the reasons why Singaporeans engaged in this political trade-off, accepting uh, authoritarian rule, the curbing of civil liberties, political liberties, in return for their deliverance of material well-being. In other words, growth with social equity a level of social mobility. Um, now, this has, uh, kind of, it has eroded this, this social compact, particularly following the economic reforms from about the mid-1980s, the selective implementation of neoliberal uh, policies, uh, most glaringly obvious in terms of the privatization of various sectors of the, uh, the political economy, um, and also social services, hospitals, for example, um, has been it's been privatized. Uh, public transport, power services, telecommunications, and and so on. Now, the other factor that needs also to be uh, this is uh, I, I came up with this um, diagram early this morning before my flight to. Um, to, uh, to um, Canberra, it, what it does show here is the way by which other Northeast Asian uh, uh, economies and polities have shifted from the authoritarian state to the electoral authoritarian type regime and then towards uh, more pluralistic polities. Um, and Dan Slater and others have referred to this as strong state democratization. It has happened. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. However, Singapore has stayed in this zone, uh, like Malaysia has stayed in this zone, and it hasn't quite graduated. Um, but the point, and uh, here I, I kind of uh, disagree with Michael, um, that that the PAP has held back this 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 graduation, this this political movement. And it's, it's actually uh, something that has not just stifled the political development of Singapore, but has stifled the, 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 the economic development of Singapore uh, as, as well. But the point to note here is the sophisticated opposition campaign, um, particularly Workers' Party, and I would argue other parties as well, such as the SDP, uh, uh, they uh, produce very attractive candidates. Uh, what's interesting about their candidates, the lineup of these candidates, many of them are people with uh, very impressive academic credentials. Uh, what was uh, People that in the past joined the PAP, people with uh, PhDs, masters, first class honours and so on. Many of them have, have now joined the opposition uh, party. In, in addition to that, many of these Mandarin scholars are also from the PAP establishment, former Mandarins, 
people like Tan Ji Se, for example, who was the former uh, principal <coughs> private secretary to Go Chok Tong. And I should be winding up. Um, the other di dimension is the number, the rising number of critical Democrats in the political scene in Singapore. These are people that are fiercely committed towards advancing uh, Singapore's democratization, committed towards the values to do with human rights, uh, social justice, willing to go to jail, willing to push the boundaries, learning from the campaign, the Berse campaign across the causeway, learning from the Reformasi campaign, uh, by various so political actors in Malaysia, learning from developments in Indonesia, in Thailand, and other parts of Southeast Asia. And these critical Democrats are now actively involved in the opposition parties and also actively uh, involved as bloggers uh, as, as well. Um, now, if we look at many of the speeches, the articles written by critics of the PAP, and as I've noted earlier, many of them are, were from the uh, PAP establishment, Chan Tan Ji Se in particular, National Regeneration Program. Basically, the main thrust of his argument is that what, what Singapore needs is to reclaim the former social compact, growth with equity, reclaiming the developmental state. Uh, more recently, a prominent economist, Lim Chong Ya, put forward the same idea, the need to reclaim the social compact that the uh, a substantial majority of ordinary workers in Singapore are very much underpaid. Um, and that the, nas the NWC, National Wages Council, has undermined, uh, compromised the social compact. These arguments were also noted during the presidential elections towards the end of 2011. Um, now, I've run out of time, but I will finish my um, presentation by noting very briefly superficial po policy reforms uh, are post-elections. Post um, and reinforcing the, my introduction, my introductory comments, that it seems to me that Lee Sian Lung and the PAP uh, leaders uh, are not fully committed towards qualitative reform, uh, reconfiguring unpopular policies such as the labor policies, immigration uh, policies, and a whole range of policies. They're appear to be geared towards tinkering around here and there, uh, but not geared towards, they're not geared towards qualitative uh, change in keeping and in tandem with uh, the concerns of ordinary uh, Singaporeans. There's all this talk about national conversation and so on. It's been in the news quite a bit, but it seems to me that it's more rhetoric than reality, but the point here is that it's to their, not in their long-term interest really, to, fall, to, to adopt this, this approach of not really <coughs> adhering to the, to the groundswell of discontent on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lili, um, for the very interesting uh, analysis. The evolution of uh, developmental state, that's a very interesting idea. I mean, Larry Diamond has talked about hybrid democracies. And just in Southeast Asia, we have this whole spectrum. So where does Singapore sort of fit into that? I mean, it's been labeled authoritarian democracy, uh, sometimes euphemist, uh, euphemistically guided democracy. So it'll be interesting to see where Singapore fits into that. I'm sure we, have, uh, we can have a lot more discussion in the Q&A later. Next. Um, we have Associate Professor Bilbir Singh, who will be discussing uh, the voter rejection of, <coughs> of PAP, Not Persistent or Transient. Ross is next. Ross is next. Ross is next. Ross is next. Different Ross. list. We got two. That's alright. Oh, yeah? Would you like to go first? Your... No, no, no. <laughs> I'm very orderly. I'm Singaporean. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you could go first, you be, because we have the same topic, so just a quick introduction. I'm very obedient to. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. 
Uh, Bilbil Singh is the Associate Professor and Acting Head of the Center of Excellence for National Security at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Prior to joining CEN CENS, he has been teaching in the Department of Political Science and U.S. for the past 30 years. Bilbil, please. Thank you, thank you to the organizers, Greg, uh, Navy, and it's lovely to be back to my alma mater. <coughs> I think I share the sentiments expressed by the speakers earlier. And in fact, one of the interesting things is actually there are many parallels between Singapore and our neighbor across the causeway of Malaysia. Uh, ten minutes, I can hardly say anything actually. But a couple of things, I think, worth uh, benchmarking. Firstly, I think the economic lackluster like, performance all around us is having a direct impact. I think economics plays a fundamental role in the character and uh, uh, nuances and dynamics of Singapore politics. Never forget that. That's number one. Number two, I think Singapore has effectively entered into a post Lee Kuan Yew era. <coughs> what does that mean? Uh, Mr. Lee, for better or for worse, I think has dominated politics. Uh, I think his domination uh, is withering away very, very fast. And uh, it's a matter of time before he disappears, actually. Uh, two weeks ago, we really thought he died. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was the national sentiment. I got an SMS, the emperor is dead. <laughs> you know? so, but I think we are entering de facto, I will argue today, into post-LKY environment. I think that's going to have a fundamental, fundamental impact on the PAP, on the opposition, and I think the working of Singapore, the whole psyche of Singapore. Singapore's politics, we have never had a succession in their country. Suharto post Suharto, Mahathir post Mahathir, whatever. But in Singapore, I think we are about to see the first succession politics in the country. And I think that's important. And, uh, and it's not just talking about it, I think the whole meaning of it is going to be fundamentally important. And thirdly, the third factor is the triangular relationship between the PAP, the opposition, and the electorate. I think we are going to see a fundamental movement. The opposition was basically out on the limb all these years. Uh, the best performance was, of course, 63. And then the PAP only got 43% of the popular vote. The opposition actually got a majority, but the PAP was able to secure 37 out of the 51 seats. Now, how will this shift in the triangle impact on the dynamics of uh, Singapore politics? And the question is, uh, what about voter reje uh, rejections? Is this transient uh, or permanent? I mean, my take so far after Singaporean, we work on Singapore, I teach on Singapore politics for the last 25 years. Uh, first thing, Singaporeans are very conservative politically, lest you forget. Number two, the PAP is an ultra-conservative political force. Don't expect fundamental shifts. And partly because of their whole experience about what they went through, what the PAP is, something which actually we have not spoken about. I think the PAP is a very, very powerful institutionalized organization, an organism. Uh, its roots is like a hydra-headed monster everywhere in the system. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. By the way, Lim Chong Yeh's son married Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, Lim Chong Yeh's daughter married Lee Kuan Yew's second son. You know? So there's some problems going there, but still. So that's the family. <laughs> oh, but they're, they're still living in the same roof. But that's family. And for Lim Chong Yeh to say that, it's interesting. It's interesting. So I think we are going through that sort of shift and changes. A number of questions to throw, for, throw to you before. Uh, okay, I can give you my conclusion. My conclusion is we're going to see more opposition in Parliament. No doubt about it. It's coming. And it's going to come very, very fast. But whether that will actually translate into regime change, I think it's a totally different issue. I don't think so for a long time. Singaporeans, and the Singapore Chinese majority in particular. And then the systemic manner of dominance. This party has been in power since 59. And not only that, I mean, the institutionalization of hegemony is very unique. Sorry, I always call Singapore the most successful communist country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, if you understand what I'm trying to say, I you know, started my career here by studying the Soviet Union and the whole apparatchik system. So that's what we have, and it's very difficult. Lee Kuan Yew may go, there are a lot of little, little Lee Kuan Yews in the system. How do you face that? I mean, it's not easy. So uh, a couple of things uh, before I uh, say a couple of other things. Uh, number one, I think the international environment, I think is very important. Don't forget that. I think there's a direct impact. So many of our children are overseas. 
people travel. So what's going on? Bursay, Reformacy. I mean, people are coming. I'm saying, my <coughs> students, my God, in Cambodia there's a demonstration. Why can't we have one in Singapore? <laughs> I mean, hey, that's, that's a damning condemnation of the system for, for whatever you want to think of. And these are the younger kids. And these are guys sent by the Singapore government agency called the Singapore International Foundation to help Cambodians and they come back and say, you know, we were facing demonstrations in, in Rompeng, but we can't demonstrate in Singapore. Interesting. Number two, uh, I think, I'm not, the issue of, is this a rise of democracy? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. But I think definitely it's a rise of politics. There's definitely the rise of politics. And where for so long, this was actually kept. Without the ruling party agreeing to open up, releasing it slowly, I don't think we would have it. So give credit to that. I think there is a slow management taking place. Whether they can actually manage the whole thing is another issue. Lest you forget, in 2009, it was Lee Siang Lung who said, I want nine opposition in power. <coughs> Maybe if I want to be uh, on the other side, I'll say, actually, he was very disappointed with the 2011 general election results. Only six came in, he wanted nine. <laughs> I mean, this is one way of looking at it. And this partly explains why he was actually uh, as if nothing happened to him, as if nothing happened as far as the GE was concerned. And maybe he was looking for an opportunity to get rid of a lot of people whom he did not like for one reason or another, people whom he thought were actually sabotaging him. I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Lee Siang Lung, as a person, by the way, he was my commander in the armed forces, I think he's a gem of a human being. Now, as a politician, it's another story, but I think if you are Singaporean politically, I think he has done damn well. He has done damn well politically. Our five day week club, we be borders, says, well, you go on. These are, Singaporeans are very materialistic. This is where he came in, he stood well, very well. Now, I think the biggest fear we have today is hey, this man had cancer before, he bumps off, or he's kicked off, or whatever. What after Sian Lu? I think it's one of the biggest questions in our mind. And the conclusion is, we don't think the opposition is ready. We don't think so. So who in the PAP? Now, it's a terrible uh, it's a question which has been discussed at various levels. And I think people are saying, better know the devil, we know rather than the devil, we do not know. That sort of uh, conclusion. And he's seen as a relatively strong man. And I think as Mike said it, for a for son to kick his father sideways and downward was an amazing, amazing performance. That actually enhanced his credibility tremendously. And he did not do it once, you know. He did it consistently so many times. I recorded seven times so far. He knocked his father off. And for a filial son, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, the next thing is, I think the conclusion is the political formula is not working. But have they been able to come up with a new one? I don't think so. I think they are trying, they are groping. And this is where I think is part of their problems. They have got so many yes men in the system. And bringing generals into, into cabinet is not the answer. And I think this is going to be part of the undoing. And I think all, both the generals are doing so badly. And one of them has been tipped to be the next prime minister of the next generation. My God, how wrong they can get. So I think, interesting. Uh, draconian laws we have not spoken about. We have them. We are not talking about removing the ISA. We are not even talking of window dressing the ISA. Interesting. So uh, laws, there are all kinds of laws which are able to restrain and constrain a lot of people. How many minutes? Still got uh, two, three. Okay. Uh, to me, the big picture is very important. The big picture in the region, beyond. But I think there's a big picture within Singapore politics which is changing. And the moment LKY goes, I think the PEP, the PEP, most of the guys there are actually looking at the old man. Huh? We call him Kuan Yin. <laughs> or Kuan Yu. Kuan Yin is a uh, goddess of mercilessness. Mercy is mercilessness. Very <laughs> Now, I got another question. And I think this is an important one. The PAP is a very good instrumentalist organization in terms of solving problems. Has been historically. And that has been one of his major source of legitimacy, performance. Somehow or another, it has been failing and failing badly. And some of the failures are going to take a long time to overcome and they may not be ready in time to come for the, for the next five years. And one of the biggest disasters, of course, has been housing. <coughs> Terrible disaster. It is a massive uh, vindication of 
how wrong they can be. How wrong they can be. So kids who get married, they have to wait for five years and they're not getting it. So, and uh, will they be able to solve this problem? I don't know. I think a lot of our issues is linked or interlinked to migration and housing. The anger of Singaporeans is basically connected to this. Of course, all around is the cost of living, bread and butter, uh, housing, uh, medical costs, and so on and so forth. But essentially, it's housing and migrants, foreign migrants, 1.2 of them, 1.2 million. So you cannot send them back. Many of them are PRs. And they have not just come alone, they come with their families. They're, they're taking our school position, they're taking our hospital beds, they're take, occupying everywhere. We are suffering overcrowdedness. We used to be a tiny little red dot, now we are a super tiny little red, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> so I think, how to resolve that? I think the PAP, something has gone wrong in the PAP. The left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. So infrastructure, why well, would we always boast about being the best? I think something has gone wrong. So unless they can overcome it. So is this movement away from the PAP, one minute, uh, the rejection transient or permanent? I think as far as, uh, as, far as anger is concerned, the anger can be uh, overcome by policies. Uh, will they be able to do it in time, or is it something more fundamental, or is it structural? Structural meaning social changes have uh, come to a stage where people say, we want the PAP, but we also want a very powerful and strong opposition which is able to do, do the work because the PAP has failed. And the fact that the Prime Minister himself concedes that we can make mistakes, and have made mistakes, and therefore we are sorry, how to prevent no more sorries take place, the best way to send more people into Parliament and the opposition. So I think that sort of things are going on, but just one footnote. In 1991, the opposition won four seats. But the following elections, the opposition was reduced just to two or one. So in other words, if the PAP learns very fast, and this is my last point, if they learn very fast, the water rejection can be reversed. However, I'm of the view, I think the PAP have lost the script. I think the new generation said enough is enough. The PAP is still good for the time being, but for the time being, the best answer to the PAP's problem is to have more opposition in parliament. Therefore, the question given to me is the PAP's decline. Water rejection in parliament permanent? My answer is yes. But I'm not too sure about water rejection meaning and equates to uh, regime change. I don't think so. My gut feeling says I don't think so. But uh, again, there are three small things as I'm moving, I'm going to say. One, <laughs> it's a fundamental scandal at the very top. Number two, there's a split in the PAP. Or number three, and this is the key, can the opposition get the act together? Because the opposition is also fighting each other. And as long as that happens, I think the answer is water rejection will be permanent at one level, but not at the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bilber. Turbulence or transition? Some uh, interesting ideas. I have to confess to being a bit frightened during your thing when you talked about little Likwanis popping up. I was thinking of cloning, eugenics, a lot of ideas were going through my head. Just a personal anecdote, my grandmother has been living in Singapore since the Japanese occupation and she voted for the first time last year and it wasn't the main election, it was the presidential elections. So when people ask me where I stay in Singapore, I say the headquarters, the capital of Singapore. What is that? Tanjung Paga. Because the main man is there. My GRC was the only place that was not contested so I couldn't put in the young vote and you know where the young vote tends to swing. Okay, moving on, moving on from politics. We will be looking at media reforms in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, Dr. Ross will be sharing with us. Um, Ross was the recipient of the Australian Government That's Endeavour. Oh, no, 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 let me, let me see my brain in just 10 seconds. Where he conducted research on press freedom in Indonesia. He's also worked with the Jakarta Post and the Lombok Post. His current research examines the nature of press freedoms in Southeast Asia. Thanks very Take much. it away, Ross. <laughs> Thanks very much. Ross Tapsel, young guy, I haven't written any books. Uh, <laughs> let's move on. Um, I'll get straight into it, start the clock. Uh, this presentation, I'm hoping really to talk about media trends rather than media reforms, although I suppose you can see it in that way, and at least start a discussion about the future impact of online political discourse on electoral change. As you all know, social media has in particular been seen as a driving force for electoral change in Malaysia and Singapore. And Singapore. In both uh, countries, the opposition is hopeful that the increasing access to alternative, in alternative information will further undermine government control monopoly of the mainstream media. 
Now this argument is based largely on statistics of internet usage. When we look at uh, internet usage in Malaysia and Singapore, in Malaysia um, we have 61% of the population using the internet and 81% in the populated areas. 70% uh, 70, 70 of Malaysians now live in cities, uh, while in 1980 it was 35%. So the, the general idea is that the more people there are in cities using the internet, the more likely uh, they are to access alternate information. In Singapore, of course, these statistics are even more impressive on percentage of internet usage. And in a recent survey uh, conducted by actually by the mainstream press, press, when they asked Singaporeans, how do you access your political news, more people said via, the, via online on the internet than they said uh, traditional print media. Uh, so therefore, they, the uh, argument is that we're more like people are more likely to read independent news. Um, there is a belief amongst many of the opposition, but of course including academics, that the rise of alternative voices of information, mostly online, means mainstream media uh, will make more of an attempt to cover opposition rallies. And that coverage of the opposition will indicate the benchmark that the online media uh, has set uh, and for what is regarded as professional media in Malaysia and Singapore um, by an increasingly uh, savvy, net savvy uh, Singaporeans and Malaysians. Um, I suppose what I want to argue in this is I, I would like to focus perhaps on the negative. Where's Mazuki in his glass of water? I, I suppose I'd say the glass is maybe I'm going to be focused on the glass half empty here. Um, and the two concerns that I would like to raise perhaps here, uh, the first is the decline of independent journalism in Malaysia. And the second is uh, the convergence of platforms in Singapore. So I won't go too much into Malaysia because we're probably Malaysianed out by now, uh, and I sh you know this is the Singapore update. But just because it's important to preface, um, I think that something that has often been missed has been the de has been the decline of some of these or the, the failure of some of these independent journalism ventures in Malaysia since 2008. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but um, there, there were some you know highly political. Uh, print media but also online media that has since failed. Uh, in 2010, Off the Edge, a magazine ceased publication after a string of losses. Um, the chief editor, Jason Tan, sent the lessons, said the lessons he learned from this experience was that you should never take your eye off the ball, the ball being the business and all different parts that make it work. The nut graph shut offices and retrenched everyone in August 2010. And although the online site is still partially maintained, one of the lessons that the Nut Graph's co-owner, Jacqueline Surin, said was that providing good journalism is expensive. Um, now, perhaps these uh, publications had, had aimed for a too high-end, uh, politically-minded, fluent English language market, but recently the Medeca Review um, closed down and, uh, and after attempting to reinvent itself uh, in late 2011 when its anonymous funders declined to continue their support. In its recent uh, eulogy not so long ago, uh, the Medeca Review kind of lambasted its readership and said that it was disgraceful that no one would want to pay uh, to keep this, online, uh, kind of keep this online site going and what does that say about independent journalism. Um, Malaysia Insider survives, as does BFM, but the, the increasing, I suppose, concern is perhaps more to do with uh, the defamation suit, particularly against Malaysia Insider. And finally, uh, I just got there, uh, Hata Wahari, a voice of reform, pushing for more independent journalism within the mainstream media in the National Uni Union of Journalists, um, who spoke out publicly and said it's time we stop being a, a lapdog for the government. He was sacked for tar tarnishing the image of his employer, <laughs> uh, which was Utusan Malaysia. So I think, it, I'll move on, but I think the failure of these ventures should not go unnoticed when we're talking about an assessment of media freedom in the region. Okay, this, the main part of this I would like to talk about is what is an increasing trend and what I would call, I suppose, the increasing, uh, what I would call an era of convergence of mainstream media in Singapore, Malaysia and in Southeast Asia more broadly. Um, when I talk about convergence, I'm talking about the synchronisation or synchronising of all media platforms, such as broadcasting, print and video, into one online media site. And specifically, the trend in Singapore, of course, uh, and Malaysia is to maintain, but particularly Singapore, is to maintain a news website um, in, addition to traditional, in addition to traditional news platforms, um, but which now synchronises blogging and social media into the websites. And I'll show some in a minute. I've just got an example of the strategy up there that you can read. 
Um, so in a nutshell, because you know, time is, is important, the largely separate realms of social media and mainstream media are fast becoming connected into one large news cycle. And so what we'll see in the uh, mainstream uh, is that this is an example of the New Straits Times, uh, sorry, of the Straits Times uh, website is what they would call citizen journalism. And the idea is that the mainstream media now needs to incorporate all of these into um, their marketing strategy, to their media strategies. While previously Facebook, Twitter, social media and so on were purely for, for social purposes, uh, they now consider these tools to be essential in the dissemination of news and commentaries. Uh, as you can see in the example of citizen journalism, it's hardly politically minded. Man cycling <laughs> with one hand uh, while using his handphone. Breaking news. Uh, and sexy Japanese DJ infects arena clubbers with disco fever. Um, so this is, this is the, the Straits Times and, and uh, view of citizen journalism. Uh, so, but, but they have, media executives do understand this with the decline of, of print media, the decline of newspapers, um, the decline of readership for the most part, or stagnation of readership of newspapers, that their survival is dependent on their ability to combine traditional news content with now content from new media platforms. And that this, of course, includes social media. And I've also got a, another example from Straight Science there on uh, Razor TV Eyewitness C Act report. Um, of all the, the things that you can you can do if you have your uh, iPhone, if you have your phone, and you can film it, you can send it through uh, to the Straits Times. Now, I know what you're saying. You're probably thinking Singaporeans like Singaporeans aren't going to buy it. It's it's clearly not the citizen journalism that they're used to. Um, very much they're used to uh, expressing opinions uh, online, and that this kind of you know more bland, I suppose, form of citizen journalism isn't going to work. Um, let me preface that, I suppose, with the previous point and Medeca Review's complaint that no one wanted to pay for uh, their independent journalism. And also, uh, perhaps, worth, you know, having a look at the increasing uh, amount of mainstream media which is being accessed through Facebook. And what I've got here is a, a, a list of the main Facebook fans, as in, so if you're a fan, for those of you who don't have Facebook, if you're a fan, that means that you should subscribe to the news feed on your homepage. Um, as you can see, uh, again, hard hitting, but hilarious as well, that the number one media site is the Asian Food Channel uh, for, for Singapore. Uh, incredible numbers there of over a million. Um, but more crucially, I guess, if you look at 5, 7, 8, 9 and 10, um, that this is, and these numbers are increasing, of these mainstream media sites creating their own social network, social media websites uh, in which people will subscribe to. So, yeah, three, uh, I'll, I'll sum up. But, um, you know, the, these statistics are increasing and I, I think perhaps a sign that, uh, that the, the strategy may work uh, for the mainstream media. So to conclude, um, I guess the era of convergence, if I'd call it, is still evolving. Um, so maybe uh, predictions are foolish, but let me finish with two points. One, many Malaysians and Singaporeans, of course, have become very much used to expressing opinions online and later through more specific social media platforms. Uh, should these media companies attempt to converge these social media uh, platforms and hinder freedom of expression by doing so, by editorial content and so on, um, they may be in for a fight. But what they're backing on, if you go, went back to that strategy, what, the, what these sites are backing on, is that the idea of social media is actually, uh, the audience is actually more likely to be looking for live and fast updates through social media and through Facebook and Twitter. So it's about the speed and it's about, uh, uh, and it's about live coverage. And that in the future, the only resource, the only people, the only media companies who will be able to do this are the resource-rich mainstream media that can do this more effectively, say, than the on-the-ground, you know, alternative type of media. I'll finish there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ross. So it seems that Facebook or Twitter revolution is not on the cards in Singapore. Then. <laughs> Next, um, we move on from the media. We look at the economy. Uh, we have Associate Professor Chandra Tangavelu from the National University of Singapore. Aside from publishing and presenting numerous papers on ASEAN economies, he's also the researcher at the, fittingly at the Ministry of Manpower in Singapore. 
Okay, uh, first thing is, uh, I don't represent any political party. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pure academic. Uh, I do work for the government. Uh, and I do get involved a little bit on uh, the, the, the way policies are developed. But um, I don't get involved in politics. And, and uh, Hall was telling me, I was sitting beside him, uh, what did you get into? You know, a whole group of uh, political scientists here, and one or two economists. So uh, I try uh, in my presentation I'll try to touch on some of those issues. Uh, but um, strangely enough, uh, Singapore is not driven very much by politics. Uh, if you really deep uh, go deep into their thinking, they are purely driven by economics, and Lily is right. Um, the way we set up our institution, political institutions, are in line with uh, economic objectives. We set up economic objectives, then we think how we want to maximize uh, that economic objectives uh, with our political system. So when Lily put this spectrum, and then she suggested that we move and implemented neoliberal policies. We've always been implementing neoliberal policies, not the first time. What I, I will show you. When we did this new new kind of liberal policies, uh, we find it much more difficult to shift the political institutions to align and maximize the returns. And that creates a lot of conflict. Uh, com not conflicts in terms of what the, the government wants to do, but more in, in conflicts in terms of how fast we can manage the, 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 the social returns itself. So let me start. Um, uh, and really, uh, it's, when you show the picture, they actually appointed a first uh, female minister, full minister to parliament in the recent... Uh, so to be fair to them, uh, they are trying their best. And, and uh, One. Bavaria is right, Bavaria is right. Um, they're very systematic, very orderly. And maybe in the new kind of economic growth, new liberal kind of system, you cannot be very orderly and expecting a very systematic change in the economy. Maybe that is creating a lot of conflict. No? And it put, particularly in terms of how they want to put in the policy and how they want the policies to trickle down. No? And uh, again, uh, my observation is uh, uh, institution-wise and also in terms of, uh, I'm not a politician, but uh, in terms of party-wise, I think we are ready preparing for the post uh, Lee era. I think that mindset has already been set. And that mindset has been already been set from the last election, not this election. And it's very clear the way, the way they systematically they're going to do that because they know a uh, 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 senior minister or another minister, Lee, will, is not going to last forever. So. The, the idea of what is going to have uh, is already been already been worked out uh, pretty nicely. Uh, let me go ahead and get into my presentation. Uh, and when uh, first thing is, I want to thank Craig and the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I even the last minute I was thinking not to come because I was telling Craig uh, there's nothing much I can add to whatever the politicians have already said. Because I'm an economist, so I only go with facts and I'll go with more empirical evidence to prove my case. So uh, then uh, uh, Craig was saying, I should provide more economic angle than getting into more political component, which is not my forte anyway. Okay, uh, let me start my, my presentation. Uh, I have 88 slides, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, See, the, the important thing for you to think about is uh, Singapore is already transiting to a very high, high wage economy, just like Malaysia, and, uh, and it's also moving to high value added activities. And there's two things about this title. One is high value added activities creates jobs, but create more skilled jobs. And uh, at the same time, uh, it wages rises because of scarcity of labor, Singapore is a small open economy. We have scarcity of labor, and labor is the only indigenous resource we have, and how we're going to use this resource become very important. The only other indigenous or two other indigenous resource which uh, we have is infrastructure. Very good in doing infrastructure. And as Lily pointed out, the third strong resource we have is a huge resource, uh, foreign reserve itself. Okay. Uh, 
our strategy, uh, whether you go to 1970s after independence or even 80s and even now, our strategy is very clear. It's always economic strategy is the, the paramount important for us. And once we think of economic strategies, then we think of how we could align our, our system and the social system in line with the economic uh, strategy. But interestingly, uh, we realized that uh, having that, it uh, creates a lot of conflicts in the economy. And I'll highlight three kind of conflicts that are arising. When you push your economy to a very liberal kind of economy, you find that at this stage of growth, high value added and high wage growth, it creates three kind of issues. And one issue really you already touched uh, is the widening wage gap. And this widening wage gap issue is not just prone to Singapore, it's prone to all the Asian countries, including Malaysia, including uh, uh, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. They're handling it in a very different way. Singapore is trying to handle it, it in a different way. When you push a liberal policies, you, you create the social issues. In the 70s and 80s, we have less of that issue, social issue to think about. So we went on full-fledged liberal policies, attracted MNCs, it was much more easier, labor intensive, capital intensive, we created a lot of growth, a lot of equality, and a lot of trickle-down effects. But increasingly, you find the liberal policies are creating growth, a lot of growth. I will show you. Uh, In uh, 2010, we had 14.8% growth. And that is the growth everybody is looking forward to in, at this current time. And current time is very, very strange. I used to tell my students and even uh, policymakers that it's very strange that we can ramp up to a very high growth if we want. And we can ramp up to high employment creation if we want. We created, in, in 2010, we created nearly 150,000 jobs. In 2011, we created 130,000 jobs. This year, we projected to create hit at least 90,000 to 100,000 jobs easily. Just trying to slow down and control the economy has become very important for us. So it's something unique about the economy that we are driving, something unique about the institution that allows us to drive this and drive growth. But uh, the issue with 14.8% growth, a lot of questions we raise is how much of that goes to the middle income and the low income, how much of that translates to real wealth growth, which is again much more difficult when you press yourself to this kind of open economy, open value-added growth and, and skill jobs growth and so on, you find that uh, the trickle-down effects are getting slower and slower. It's become a real, real challenge for them. And that is reflected when you look at uh, the election itself, only three things determine the election. Pure economics, nothing else. Singaporeans are driven by wealth, and the year is right. We are very not. I am not orderly. I am uh, <laughs> sometimes I like to speed and so on. I am not very orderly. I, I hate the year. I am telling you, I hate the year. I don't like the year, and I also don't like the CEO. I think you can do it better. But and I also don't like the population policy, right? But this, they, they came out with. Uh, limiting to two, now they are allowing more liberal, uh, uh, more uh, uh, population growth and they find a fertility rate cannot even replace itself. And yeah, the government go out and, and do somehow omit that part of the policies they put in might not be kicking in. No? It, it give us uh, uh, that, not that kind of return because the economy structurally are just very, very fast. And uh, uh, only have three minutes. Oh, three minutes is so fast. <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, the, some empirical evidence, most of growth is coming from services. And remember, services are mostly uh, non-tradable sector. It's not tradable sector. So the key tradable sector, where most of the value added and wages are, where wages are growing very fast, is the skill, biomedical, chemical, and uh, electronics. And uh, the services sector, other than the financial sector, wages are very, is growing, but not as growing as fast. So the non-tradable sector, when they liberalize, is not creating, it's creating a lot of jobs, but not creating the kind of quality jobs which you want. And then again, this contributes to avoiding wage gap. And uh, why immigrants? Why immigrants are important? Uh, as you push for higher value added activities, there's two things that immigrants bring. One, they bring skills. And when you globally, when you look around, there's only two things that have changed. One, uh, foreign direct investment. And two, globally, labor mobility has increased, both skill and unskilled. Both skill and unskilled labor mobility has increased, and particularly the 
unskilled labor mobility has increased in ASEAN countries, including Malaysia. And not only uh, uh, a lot of countries are using this kind of labor to drive their growth. So when Singapore opens up, uh, we open up more for the skilled labor. So that, again, uh, going back to the issue of higher value added jobs and higher wages, most of the jobs are going to the, uh, the, the skilled immigrants, not to the locals. Why not the locals? Because in the 70s and 80s, it's only take 13 years to actually create a human capital for the market. Now they're talking about higher value added jobs. It takes, you need a graduate, a postgraduate, which is going to take 16 to 18 years investment on an individual. Whereas the economy is already going on a high scale. In five to six years, you already see the kind of industries are coming. So we're talking about 10 year gap to actually fill up the human capital. So as you liberalize, you push yourself, you have to face these kind of social issues. That how fast can you ramp up the human capital itself? And government truly recognize this, that they need to ramp up the human capital. And so is Malaysia. That's the nice thing about the institutions you have in Singapore, Malaysia, and even in ASEAN. We do recognize that these are key issues that we need to drive. And we go out and get as much consensus and much systematic thinking how we're going to handle this in terms of driving uh, human capital. So the government came out with a policy. They set up three, three universities, the fourth university. Now the fifth university, they announced they're going to set up another one more university. They're going to go for 40% cohort of postgraduate <coughs> if they can. Graduate and postgraduate, push as much as possible to fill up this gap. So it is a challenge. Uh, and they are thinking about this challenge. And this is by design or not by design because our government policy is very hard to pin down at this point in time. The, the, the difference between 1992, uh, 97, five year, and the following five year and, and, and uh, 2003, 2008, you find the, the share of non-resident number has increased very, very fast. Our population has increased. In fact, the indigenous population, I think, is around 2.5, 2.6. And our population now stands around uh, 4.8 close to five, and the rest of it is purely uh, foreigners. Non-resident uh, uh, population, but purely PRs, permanent residents. So you find the political system and political institution itself is changing because you need foreigners to drive, and because the fertility rate is going down. So the question is, how am I going to maintain this? That creates spillover into the infrastructure, spillover into the crowdedness, and spillover into the social compact, and social space. So, so sociologists like to talk about social space. How close are foreigners very close to you? They are very close now. And they are very visible in, in, uh, in uh, HTB houses, which is actually the public houses. They are very, very visible. So that visibility, and together with a widening wage gap, creates a lot of social uneasiness, which is, that translates to, in the election, uh, the electoral votes because uh, their earning capacity and their earning future earning capacity might be reduced. So the, 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 the electors actually show their displeasure in terms of these policies, uh, how to manage this. It's not this policy, how are you going to manage this? What are you going to do about these things become very important. Okay. Uh, inflation is one issue that uh, they have handled. The interesting part of inflation itself is uh, just two minutes, yeah, just give me two minutes. I, the I interesting part about uh, uh, in, uh, inflation is that uh, two things is driving inflation. One, uh, whether it's important inflation or domestic inflation. Increasingly, you find that domestic uh, components are driving inflation. One is rental, housing prices, and the other one is transport. Transport prices is rising. and. As we realized that when you move to ERP, uh, uh, in order to have a neutral revenue stand, right, that means when I move from one policy to the other, I want to keep my revenue neutral, uh, I have to increase my car population because I, you go from a, a quota system to a user pay system. In a user pay system, you have to increase the number of cars. So the car population increase, we have congestion. So they realized that they created uh, congestion, they have to reduce congestion, so they let the ERP rise. So now our ERP, um, 
uh, has came down and now is standing around $70,000. So that ERP is uh, COE, the new certificate entitlement allows you to buy a car. And that only lasts for 10 years. And that costs $70,000. So, which basically means they should have cut that COE before. They shouldn't let the COE go down to 20000 So they should have cut the COE high, limit the number of cars. But since they moved to the ERP, they have to allow more cars to have the revenue neutrality. But again, now they're going back and reducing the COE, uh, the, uh, CO, uh, the, uh, they're keeping the ERP and reducing the COE as much as possible, but it has skyrocketed to 70,000 jobs. 70,000 uh, uh, COE, uh, 70,000 uh, per certificate of entitlement, which basically translating into higher transport costs and higher inflation. Okay, uh, the, the, the other component is aging. Uh, Singapore is aging very fast, and that is the reason why we have increased the, the population size. Uh, but again, uh, issues like infrastructure, rental, and, and, and housing prices also increase. When you double the PR number and the land size is very small. Again, that has another implication in terms of uh, um, higher inflation. As you can see, just give me one minute. As you can see, we, uh, we are getting much more fatter on the top. Uh, what's so uh, important about this is uh, the government is thinking about this very carefully. What's so uh, uh, is important issue is one fiscal sustainability. Uh, this again is very important for us. The reason is as you get more aging, people might rely more on transfers rather than uh, your smaller population can actually uh, support the tax base. The second component is uh, private savings and investment is going to change because when you get older, you're going to resave more. That means people are going to take up more from CPI, Central Provident Fund. Again, the government might not have enough money. The last one is productivity. Uh, aging population will lead to lower productivity and lower growth. So again, this become a very important issue. Okay, let me finish the last one. Uh, widening wage gap. Uh, let me show you uh, the Gini. Right? And this important thing in the whole slide is only one thing. Report of the Ministerial Committee of Low Wage. That is the most important component. It's not this. So the committee went out and said, we have recognized the problem that there is a widening wage gap. What can we do about the widening wage gap? What policy stand we're going to be, they're not going to sweep this under the carpet. So they are trying to address this. And in fact, you can see that 90th percentile of the wages are rising very fast. They are the asset creating uh, component. And the lower percentile is going down. The sad part is the middle income squeeze. That is really, really squeezing us a lot. Uh, okay, I will finish here, thank you. Thank you, Chandra, for the economic angle. Unfortunately, we couldn't go through the 88 slides. Um, last but not least, uh, fittingly to wrap up uh, this session as well as the earlier today session, we have um, Associate Professor Bridget Well from the SMU, and she will be doing a comparison of Singapore and Malaysia looking at elections and dominant party decline. I know that I'm holding you back as the last speaker, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. But I'd like first to thank Greg and to really to uh, congratulate all the students for organizing and putting this together. Really well done. It's great to be here at the ANU, and I want to begin with my takeaway point because people may be leaving at the end. And the question I asked in my presentation is whether or not there will be political liberalization and further political liberalization in Malaysia and Singapore. And the answer for both is yes and yes. Uh, but much more in Malaysia and much less in Singapore. And what I want to do is to lay what I see are common features that I think will contribute to this political liberalization. Uh, and I think I'll build on what was said in earlier speakers. And I want to lay out the key factors that I think are going to be very important in this comparison. The first is we have dominant party de-alignment. We have de-alignment from the PAP and our military. The second issue is that we have quite polarized regime support. And here I'm drawing from polling data, and I'll go into this point a little bit later. But we do see a quite very polarized electorate, uh, and in a sense, a change in the patterns of regime support. And more importantly, the issues that are actually leading to declining regime support are not being solved. 
and I'll come back to that a little bit later. The third point I have is you have more people's empowerment more broadly. And I think this is something we've, uh, we've not heard enough about today in this discussion. We've had changes in society from below. And the societies themselves are really transforming. And this is partly, as was discussed earlier, by issues of Ross in terms of issues of uh, media. But I think it's in the society itself. And I'll go through some of those elements. A constraining and, in some ways, a catalytic uh, force for change is the legacies of the strong men. Mahathir and Lee Kuan Yew both serve as an obstacle for change, but it similarly are pushing for changes because of the legacies and the problems that their legacies have created. That's issue four. Issue five is that you have two leaders, both Najib and uh, Lee Sun Long, who have weakened mandates. And I will argue that in, whoever wins in the next election in Malaysia will have a weak mandate, a weak mandate. And Lee Sin Long, in contrast to the earlier speakers, I believe has an extremely weak mandate in the context of Singapore. And I'll go into why that is a little bit later. And the last point that I have in my 10 minutes is to talk about what I call a strengthening middle opposition. The opposition in both countries are actually strengthening vis-a-vis -vis the de-alignment of the, opposition, the uh, dominant parties. And these are the key points that I want to try to give you as a framework to try to understand why I see liberalization happening in both places. But I do feel that, and I want to close and I want to sort of get to the, the, the key point before I go back into that, is that I think when we look at Singapore, the biggest label that Singapore has had is that it's exceptional. And whether or not it is exceptional is a very interesting question. But as I've been thinking about this presentation, the key thing is, can Singapore be exceptional? Can it be a party that can stay in power and reform and transform? Uh, you know, these two countries, Malaysia and Singapore, are the, mo the longest dominant one-party systems now in the world. Can they exist and persist? And my view is that probably Singapore can have, a, it's a little bit of its exceptionalism, but I don't think Malaysia can. I think we've seen in the last three years, as, um, as Clive has pointed out, that an UMNO cannot reform hmm, uh, in power. Uh, but now let's get to these key points. Number one, dominant party de-alignment. Surveys show across the board that both the UMNO and PAP have a weaker brand, party brand, especially among young people. The youth is extremely important in Malaysia in the sense that it makes up 40% of the electorate under the age, 50% uh, of the electorate under the age of 40, and I can, I'm still thinking youth is 40, um, <laughs> uh, and it actually makes up 25% of the electorate under the age of 40. And in this next election in Malaysia, the decisive determinants will be the young people. Uh, in the context of Singapore, they may make larger numbers, but in fact, they are actually a very important focal point because there, so much is being placed on the youth in terms of the issues in the economy, uh, and, and I think they are a very critical voice. Huh? A weaker party brand. As is pointed out by my colleagues, both parties are having a problem attracting new good talent. There is a leadership deficit within the, both the PAP and UMNO. You ask yourself, who are the good leaders? Who are the future leaders? And there is a critical deficit. Importantly, you have a decline in the party machinery and the patronage of both parties. And I think we, uh, I, I disagree a little bit with Bill here, in that I think that while the PAP is all-encompassing, all its machinery, its grassroots, has decayed quite considerably, as has an UMNO. You have insulated party leaders. One has to understand that we have a dynamic in Southeast Asia where we have sons of former prime ministers. These are people who have been insulated since childhood from the societies that they live in. And they do not know their societies to the same degree that the earlier generations of the Mudeka leaders know. The Tun Razak understood his society. The Najib Tun Razak does not have the same touch. The same thing could be said about Lee Sin Long. These are insulated leaders. Uh, in many key ways, especially in the nature of the way the systems have evolved. And you have, interestingly enough, for both UMNO and PAP, their mantra relies heavily on the past, their success of the past, 
and they have not really clearly defined what is their present success. And you can see this in continuation, even in Lisa Long's most recent National Rally Day speech, where it was the same old messages of family, of conservatism that came up with, and it is a very, it's a persistence of the past, as opposed to a real engagement with the future, or even the present in the context of Singapore. For example, single mothers, is, not, is that not a family? Not in the way it's being defined in the context of Singapore. But that is a legacy of the past. So we have these de-alignment dynamics. We have polarized regime support. The electorate in Singapore is, defined, is divided 60-40. In Malaysia, it's 50-50. And in the next polls, you're going to see some, if we don't count the, fa the phantom voters, which I think are very important uh, in terms of the actual outcome, uh, you're probably going to see that the Barasan is going to lose the popular vote nationally. And with the changes that are happening in Sabah and in Sarawak, where there has been quite considerable transformations in the last few years, you're going to see some real significant shifts in terms of voting behavior. But within this study that I've done, it's very, which looks at polling data from the Asia Barometer surveys of the last five years, and we look specifically, at, we ask the question, what are the factors of why you support the regime in power? And we find a number of very interesting things. In both places, there is a very strong authoritarian core that want the system to stay in office. In the case of Malaysia, that core is largely Mahathirites, Malay, and in the rural and semi-rural areas. And they are very, very strong. And in the case of Singapore, we have similarly an age dynamic of people in their 40s and 50s who see the PAP in its success, an economic success. And they're very conservative, as was pointed out by Bill here. But I will point out in a few minutes that, in fact, you've had big changes in this. But there is an authoritarian core in both sides. And that is one of the things that leads to this polarization that is actually quite important. But we've had very profound question changes in attitudes. I asked the question in the polling data, is Southeast Asia becoming more liberal? And this will be hopefully in an article that I'll finally finished. Uh, but, and the answers are very interesting for the context of Singapore and Malaysia. Singapore has had the most liberal voter change over time in terms of accepting liberal attitudes. I always kind of quip to myself, maybe that's the foreigners coming in. <laughs> uh, but what in fact, actually, you have at the same time, you have had a conservative backlash. You have two very different, interesting ideological schisms happening in the context of Singapore. So what, there is a group that is supporting the opposition more, but there is also a core that is sticking, and, in, and many conservatives are actually increasing in their conservativeness on certain issues. And this you see in religiosity and other factors. Very interesting dynamic. Malaysia has had the, the sheer largest increase in number of liberals in terms of the share within the society. And it's, it's very, very interesting because it's multifaceted in terms of individualism, in terms of religiosity, different aspects in this regard. So this is a very, this contributes to the kind of polarized context. Now, the factors that explain regime support in these two countries are very different. The dominant dividing issue in, in Malaysia is corruption. Those that see the system as corrupt do not support the system. Those that do, do, do not see the corruption as important are in favor of the system. It's very simple. And corruption is a key deciding factor. Now, there are other parallel things I'll come to in a few moments, but it's critical. And interestingly enough, the factors that, per, that permeate and percolate in the context of Singapore are actually issues of values, not the economy. And the issues of that, the number one issue is nationalism. And the number one issue in this regard is the question of migration. And how they see and how they hold the sense. And we find broadly in our study of Southeast Asia that in authoritarian regimes, authoritarian regimes rely more heavily on nationalism for the base of support. And we see this in the context of Singapore. And the nationalists our uh, element is quite, quite strong, given the changes that have happened in society. One has to understand that there has been, there's 37% of the population in Singapore is now foreigners, 37%. And this change has happened in a rapid period of, of less than five years. 
There is no wonder people are angry. And we heard a little of that in the tones of Chandra and Gilvier just now in the collaborative, <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting to hear, and the population policy and other factors along these regards. And here's the challenge that PUP faces. Can it deal with the immigration problem, the populate, and the way that it's, and the way that it's dealt with it in the last six months is not cutting it for the society. This is what is a challenge. This is part of why I believe that, that if the liberalization will continue because this is the core dimensions. Now what are the other things that come in? Here we see parallels. Issues of services. Interestingly enough, it's their access to services, which I think are very important. And also inequality or perceptions of inequality. The economy is actually less important in Singapore than it is in Malaysia, but it is important. What we see are two different types of stories about the regime. In Singapore, it's a debate about values, about the country's identity. In the case of Malaysia, it's about output and the actions of government. Uh, we have two different types of stories. In some ways, Marzuki's comments about responsiveness are very important. This brings me to the third point, people's empowerment. We're dealing with two very different societies. And this is where I take issue to, with Clive. Clive, I think that in many ways to talk about 1969 and emergency, these things are very much on the agenda. I don't dismiss that. But I think we are dealing with two different very societies now. It will be very difficult for a government to call an emergency without a response in the context of Malaysia. The gov there are still, there's already a core of the society who believes that the election potentially will be stolen. So you have a mobilized electorate on all spectrums, as Marziki was pointing out, they're difficult to deal with in many key ways. You've had in these two countries the de decline of elite politics. Only in some areas do elite politics will they matter. They will matter, I believe, in the context of Malaysia, with some issues of defections and crossovers. And believe me, I know that both sides have got their lists already. <laughs> and they've put the money aside. And the, and the focus points will be in places like Sabah and Sarawak, because that's where the entrance and, and the key things are going to be. Right? But it's across the spectrum. And the elite politics will also matter for the royalty and the sultans, who will decide who gets to do what and when the election results happen. These are key dynamics, but it is a decline, right? because the elites no longer control even their own parties. Yeah. It is, you've had a massive change in civil society, and we have a lot of this, this evidence of this in the context of Malaysia from protests and others, but I think we underestimate the changes in civil society in the context of Singapore itself. You've had a broadening of uh, philanthropy groups, a much more engaged, a different social capital. You have a change in the whole structure of religious groups. Huh? This is a profound different society than it was even five years ago in this context. And you have, in this discussion, much more discourse, open discourse of politics, a willingness to show anger, to speak to power. Hmm? And it's all over, not just the social media, it's in my classroom. <laughs> Uh, and it's not me, it's my students. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they, I ask them to choose the topics that they want to talk about in the news and you'll be surprised what they choose and the responses. And every single OB marker does not exist anymore in the context of Singapore. They are thrown out the window. Race, religion, gay, sexuality, all of these things are openly discussed. It's a new Singapore, it's a new society, it's people's empowerment in this process. And I think this is a very important transformation. But we still have the strong men. They're still there. They still play a role. The Lee Kuan Yew and the Mahathir right, are actors in the system, despite even as they age. And in fact, the aging process makes them even more unstable actors. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, now, I think, for me, the problem here is there are two sectors that I think are very important. One is that they limit their ability for their parties to reform. Keep in mind that the problems of the dominant parties come from them. 
the style that they chose, the leaders, the elitist type of insulated process. Huh? In the case of Mahathir, the persistence of money politics that is so predominant in the context of Amno, that there's so much interest that is about money in the, in the discussions that I had with Amno leaders over the weekend. Huh? What's the focus on the Amno polls, not on the general elections? Huh? And what is the focus? How much money will I need to be able to consolidate these positions? This is the thinking that has become systematic. It's nothing to do with the individuals. It's the process of the legacy, the how Mahathir left his own party. And in that context, you also have challenges for policy reform that are problematic with, the, with regard to these leaders. In the case of Malaysia, the NEP and race, these issues are part of the Mahathir era. And in the case of Lee Kuan Yew, you have the issues of trying to create a new social compact, as Lily wisely pointed out, the issues of social welfare, which are becoming so pronounced in the high levels of inequality in the society. And you, until they are no longer on the political scene, it's very difficult to move out of, that, out of those constraints. And so it's no wonder that, that, that Lee Sin Long has tinkering policies. We'll do a little of this, we'll do a little of that, but it doesn't change the fundamentals because the man is there. The legacies are there. And it's hard when they're deep in the system because it is deeply ingrained into the psyche of the powers that be within both countries. So, this leads to weakened band aids. It's not a coincidence that both individuals, Najib and Lisa Long, personalized power around themselves because they don't have a team. Who are Najib's men? Who are Lee Sin Long's men? Double Where are they? <laughs> huh? They keep changing. Huh? Lee Sin Long brings in new people. He's put on a new young line frontliners. Huh? I wish them well. <laughs> They've got a hard task ahead. Huh? Uh, but it's, it's young first timers that are really going to have a baptism of fire. In the case of Najib, he keeps looking for his own men. He's trying to put his own men as candidates. No wonder the candidate lists have not been finalized. The election is yet to be held in this context. So you have a situation where they lack their own teams. These <coughs> men are technocratic, well-meaning, have business and, 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 and skill acumen, especially Najib's wife. <laughs> but in that context, <laughs> um, they are not people's politicians. They don't have that people's touch. And, and it's not as if they are trying. Yeah. They are trying. They've got all the consultants in to help them. <laughs> <laughs> but these are difficult societies. They're harder to govern. And the challenges that they have to appeal to two different cores that are merging in the society, to two different poles, to the middle ground, are very serious indeed. You know, and this is the difficult they have to navigate. You see, in the, in the context of Singapore, the move and appeal towards liberals with a death penalty, for example. And on the other side, you have a move towards the conservatives and managing the media. It is a constant navigating process that is not an easy terrain, given the, the spectrums that they have. And the final point I have here is about strengthening middle opposition. The fact of the matter is that the Barisan Nationale only has East Malaysia representation. It has very limited non-Malay support and the peninsula. BN doesn't represent the country as a totality. And when a more reactionary, more race-based party, has, which has emerged since 2008, as Clyde has indicated, uh, it becomes harder for them to be the national inclusive leader. And I, po polling shows as I've recently done in a recent article, shows that, not, that countries, they believe in inclusion. In fact, race relations in Malaysia are getting better, not worse. It's the politicians who are making them worse, in terms of surveys and trust. In the case of Singapore, the Workers' Party is winning its base and support, which is 40% of the electorate, or 39 point something, be accurate. One always has to be accurate at Singapore. <laughs> In that context, you have a situation they're winning by appealing to the middle ground, not to the edges. But they have a big task ahead because they have a challenge to deal with the other opposition actors. And the problem with the opposition on both sides is personality and conflicts. 
And you would have more of an ideological challenge in the context of Malaysia, involving issues of religious uh, kudut and other factors. But I think my own view is that those things are actually, you see within the parties, the move towards the middle ground. Some may disagree with me. I'll close now on my remarks. I've spoken too long. I apologize for that. But what I tried to do today is to suggest to you that we're going to see new politics, both in Singapore and Malaysia. And there'll be enough reason to continue to have an update next year. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bridget, for that excellent presentation and to, to bring the, the session to a very fitting conclusion. Um, Greg, do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Open to the Q&A, please, given, given time constraints, questions, succinct, comments, brief, fire away with your best question, and I, I request that you address it to specific uh, speakers. So, one, two, three, okay. Sure, keep it short. Um, thanks for all the inter interesting discussion. Uh, my question is directed to uh, Dr. Bar for this piece in the events. I'm just wondering, like, um, when you mention if it's do you specifically refer to just the political leaders within the party or um, do you see a role in business interests such as um, like the UOB chairman Bin Choi Yao or property developer such as Ming Do you see them having a role in the policy making position of the party or do you think that they don't have a role in the politics of Singapore? With the partial exception of the Chinese uh, banks, uh, there is no part of Singapore society that isn't tied to the national elite. There is just one elite in Singapore and all roads to and from power lead from that. The Chinese uh, 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 businesses, uh, particularly uh, we, you know, have maintained uh, a, enough independence to be regarded as being a problem and they have regarded, retained enough independence and enough uh, contact with the ground through uh, the Chamber of Commerce, through the CCCs, to uh, make the government uh, very, very occasionally uh, backtrack. But no, when I talk about the elite, I'm not just talking about the PAP. The PAP is just one tool of power for the elite. Just like the civil service, the judiciary, the military, business, and including the MNCs, which have come to their own accommodation with the elite. Thanks, Dalia. Um, hi, Bridget. Thanks for your talk. Um, I just wanted to follow up with your brief mention of Rosma. Um, <laughs> she, she does um, seem to, if you go by what's in alternative media, she does seem to be a very unpopular figure, um, widely parodied and criticised. Um, but I don't, I don't really know um, how true some of that criticism is. Like, um, I sometimes wonder if the attacks on her are more due to being sexist in nature, rather than does she have any real power behind the throne, as a lot of people theorise. What's your take on that, um, and especially in relation to her effect on the electorate? I think there are three uh, areas that she has influence. One is in the financial uh, area, uh, in terms of being deals and business side. Uh, number two, I think she does play a role in terms of her relationships with certain individuals within the party. Um, so who gets to be choosing as a candidate and other things, Rosma is a key uh, uh, person in that regard because she has Najib's ear and Najib listens. Mm -hmm. And I think the third area that I think has been very troublesome for Najib is that she has uh, demasculated him emasculated him on a number of, uh, number of occasions and public <coughs> occasions. And I think this has been uh, something that's had its impact within UMNO itself. Uh, um, and she, w she continues to want to have a role. And the most e clear example of that is that Malaysia doesn't have a woman's minister. Najib is the woman's minister. But is Najib the woman's minister? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that this, you know, in this particular regard, I think that she is a focal point. As, for example, Kairi was during Abdullah Badawi, eh? Rosma is for Najib. Eh? And I think that that's a problem both within UMNO and within the society. 
But I think your broader point about the sexism that exists in the context of Malaysia and Malaysian politics is quite significant. We've seen very limited increase in the number of women candidates. It's only 10%. And in fact, almost all of the, in fact, most of the women's groups are really concerned about the lack of female candidates going to be in the next election. Uh, in some parties, they're not even putting up some of the women candidates as they were, for example, in MCA and MIC. And I think we're, we're going to see a reaction to some of that. Uh, in the context of the next elections, uh, because I think people are worried about the, con the high level of contestation and the shrinking pie, and they're putting a lot of the women candidates in places that are less um, viable. Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that Malaysia is a country of women, and you said that there's a lot of contestation of space. Um, I think somebody mentioned that immigration was the big was the big issue, and uh, in my in my own work looking at documentaries <coughs> in Singapore, I think that this is also one of the reasons. Um, I'm just curious about whoever gets in, whether it's the opposition or you know other PAP. What can they do to address the immigration issue, or what can they do to address the xenophobia? Yeah, say something. I just got uh, one immediate response. I think one of the I think Singaporeans are not uh, anti-foreign. I, I don't I don't really believe that it's in their DNA. I think what happened is one. I think what uh, Shandre says in terms of the social closeness uh, has become very obvious. But I think that itself is not a real issue. I think the real issue is the opportunity cost. I think Singaporeans, most of them, are actually very upset in the sense that they don't have access to that public and private facilities. And this have gone, for example, to foreigners. An example, 15% of HDB uh, is occupied by foreigners. And Singaporeans are in a long queue. So I think their question is, hey, where do we stand? So in response to you, I think the PAP's, for example, the PAP's response for housing, if they're able to actually crank up, and in the next five years, uh, and I think it's happening, and I, my sense is we will suffer a glut in the next five to seven years, the way they are going. Uh, so the housing problem will be overcome then. So as far as housing is concerned, yes. The second thing you are watching is actually is the way hospitals are being built in Singapore. Where by the moment four hospitals were built on the cuts. I mean, so again, so what, what the PAP is doing is, hey, what is the issue which migration is causing? Schools, housing, uh, hospitals, hawker centers. So I think they are going in that form. Uh, I wonder whether that's actually the real issue. Uh, if it is, then I think the problem will be solved. Remember, the PAP is very instrumental in this. This is the problem, this is the solution. This is the problem, this is the solution. I think one of the questions which I think uh, Bridget and uh, all the others are uh, talking about, but I think we are not very clear, has there been a real social change in society? And that, uh, if that's a, that's a much more permanent issue. And that response in terms of instrument will not be sufficient to me. So I, I think uh, housing will be overcome to a large extent, my sense is. But what about the other dimension, social space, in terms of accepting foreigners and things like that? I, I mean, we have actually 5.2 million people in Singapore today. 3.8 million are locals. So, and the way we are producing, we are not going to go very far. So the number of foreigners are still coming in in big numbers. What have changed is the, the pass system has changed. Uh, we have reduced the S passes at the moment. Uh, these are uh, middle category. But uh, my sense is they're going to rank it up again a matter of time. Once the economy looks good and they feel there's a sense of shortages, up they go again. So migration is like an ERP thing, like cars. So up and down it goes, and uh, they'll reduce it just before elections. But uh, after that, up they go again. So I don't know. I mean, the past, sometimes you get you get the sense that they are really out of touch. And I think there's a much more bigger and fundamental issue, and the issues I know best. Uh, we've been through this path before. The Singaporeans are always bitching around. Uh, we are able to tolerate their bitching, and we prove them right. So they have got that cycle, that cycle, that this is a cyclical thing, and don't worry, we just bear it out. But but the difference is this: I think one, uh, the ground have changed. We got new citizens. Number three, the opposition is much more proactive. Number four, and I think I did. I don't know maybe Bridget, the new media. The new media have really made the difference. I think the last election, I suspect in 08 in Malaysia, uh, one one in Singapore, it was the new media. So when the IPS came up with a survey and said the new media had no impact, I was wondering uh, which election they were looking at. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think it made a fundamental difference. 
I think you wanted to comment on this as well, Lily? Yeah, um, thanks for the uh, question, uh, Gig. Um, I, I actually think it's, it's, you know, you talk about values and, and, and nationalism and so on, national identity. I think it's, it's strongly linked to this immigration issue. It's linked to the perception held by many Singaporeans, particularly those that didn't vote for the PAP, that the quality of life has mm. gone down, their standard of living has gone down and many people are not convinced by the argument used by the, the government that uh, we need these people to sustain continued high levels of economic growth. Uh, that, uh, you know, they are, they, uh, the, and they are referred to as foreign talent. On the other hand, many of these immigrants uh, or, or coming into the country, uh, many of them actually are not well credentialed. Um, you know, some of them are in Singapore for a short period of time, and there is the argument put forward by many economists, such as Tan Ji Se, for example, that our economy, the Singaporean economy, is very much addicted to the uh, presence of cheap foreign labour, and what that has done, it has undermined fact, uh, total factor productivity. If we looked at we look at the productivity figures, it is appalling. You know, what is it? Round about 1%? Now that is not sustainable in the long term. Paul Krugman, a well-known uh, economist, talked about that in his explanation for the financial crisis in the late 1990s. This, this formula of economic growth and development is not sustainable in the long term, borne out in the Gini coefficient uh, ratios as well. Now, look at comparable economies around the world, such as Switzerland and, you know, the Scandinavian countries, uh, countries with low levels, low population kind of base. They, they are, are able to develop, they are able to promote knowledge economies, sophisticated value-added economies and so on, without this massive influx of foreign workers, both high, high, uh, very qualified as well as the cheap uh, labour. So there are many countries around the world that have not adopted this very, I think, uh, short-term uh, a formula. So I think it's very much material. We have to look at Singapore's history. It is a nation essentially of immigrants. We are used to the idea of immigrants building this, this city-state, which has achieved a lot. So the idea of foreigners coming in is nothing new. It's just that what is done is dragging down now the quality of life of the average Singaporean. Michael, your thoughts? You don't even need to go to uh, Scandinavia to make that comparison. Compare Singapore's productivity with uh, Taiwan's, with uh, South Korea's. It's appalling. Yeah. That's not the point it's going to make. The, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things is I think there's a deep sense of disappointment and betrayal. And it, it gravitates around the social compact that you were talking about, Lily. And, it, and the notion of citizenship. Citizenship in Singapore is this amalgam of something that's contractual, where I, I give and therefore I get. And it's also bound up with this sort of emotional uh, uh, sense of entitlement because I'm a citizen. And you read back on you know, Lee Kuan Yew's speeches, Rajaratnam's speeches, all the PAP rhetoric for decades. And it's all about that. Citizens are special. Citizens Citizenship has lots of burdens that come with it, and in exchange, you have you know, special privileges over and above foreigners. That's all gone. That's what's, you know, even on the roads, you know, the, the drivers are ruder, the <laughs> bus drivers don't speak English, um, and, you know, and you're checked by jail with all of these people, and they're not doing national service. Their sons aren't doing national service. It's, it's very emotional. Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap it up soon, but I think, Greg, do you have a question? Okay, so we've got two people left, Sophia and Andy, to fill it. Okay, one, two, three. Sophia, Hi, a question? I'm Sophia. I'm a voter of Aljunit JRC. So am I. Um, dealing with migration, uh, you mentioned
mentioned the, pre uh, the perceptions that Singaporeans have of, of immigrants. What do you think about um, what uh, assertions of what immigrants have of Singapore? For example, um, there's some that say that because uh, the migrants from China now are coming from the north, uh, and historically that Singapore migrant China, Singapore Chinese are from the south. Mm -hmm. Singapore Chinese are considered lower stock. Mm -hmm. So hence there is this sort of cultural element that oh we are better than the Singapore migrants. You know, Singapore is a sort of vassal state of China or the motherland. Um, possibly the same can be said of India, where you know people come, they still have that caste system. Um, so how does that impact um, that? Um, and um, Bridget, you mentioned that. Sorry, um, Sophia, one question. Okay, fine. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> who, who, who would you like to address it to? Richard. Okay. okay. Um, last year I did a survey in 2011 of New Citizens. And what was very interesting about the views of New Citizens is that you cannot group them together. You have to look at the different ethnic communities that, where they come from. Uh, and I think the group that actually, and also when they came, right, is that there's a different timing. For example, the Filipinos came from a certain point of time, uh, as opposed to the recent mainlanders. Uh, the group that actually faces, there are two groups that face the most reaction. One is the mainlanders, as you've pointed out, uh, and the second is the North Indians that have come. Because what they're doing is they're challenging the placement of the South Indians and the Tamils with in the context uh, of Singapore society. And they report, in their assessments, a lot of examples of discrimination. And, and a lot of anger uh, that they feel and frustration about how they're treated in the society uh, from their perspective. Uh, uh, and so you see, I mean, the problem is multifaceted. And I think the big way to begin to deal with it is to recognize the, of the differences within the migrant community and actually have different sets of policies. I think there's still, there's tendency to essentialize, you know, migrants and foreigners in a particular type of way, but in fact, to not to appreciate the differences within them. Uh, and Malaysian elections has always tossed up new surprises, whether it be deregistration or disqualification of candidates during nomination day, disenfranchisement on the day of election, and so on and so forth. I'm just wondering whether in this next coming election, what is the role of newly foreign-made citizens in Malaysia? I mean, one hears of my card with expiry date, now new particularly a lot of citizens in South White Sarawak, which is critical. To, to, whether, to what extent do we, to what do we know about how the electoral, elect, electoral Commission, which is so biased, will play this card? And likewise in Singapore, while you talk about m migrants, how many new citizens have there been over the years in Singapore? And what is the impact of that in terms of the affiliation to or against uh, and the issue of new voters, uh, the new voters and move voters will be very important the next election in Malaysia. In Selangor alone, you have 300,000 new voters. Uh, now, how many of them are foreigners is, is not known. Mm -hmm. And I think there are studies being done to look more carefully at the electoral roll. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they happen before the election is probably uncertain. Mm -hmm. um, I think that. Um, the majority of new voters um, are the young people registered, compared to there is more, slightly more registration than there was before. Uh, but I think the major there are, are problems um, because of the placement of the new voters mm -hmm. in certain types of seats. Um, and I think this is where uh, the, the questions are being raised uh, at a very basic level. There was a very good article on new voters and new citizens in a book called Voting and Change in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, I refer you to that. Uh, it gives you the particulars on the number of new citizens and what are the, some of the issues that are at play. Uh, but I think in some, they are important in some constituencies in Singapore because they live at a higher level in these areas. Uh, um, and I think um, in the, they are particularly important on the East Coast. Um, uh, but I, as I pointed out before, uh, the government, the, the idea that the new citizens will support the government, uh, I think uh, it's not something that the government in, P in Singapore should rely on. Okay, thank you. Um, please join me in thanking all the wonderful speakers.